I grew up in southern Illinois, across the river from St. Louis, and I was a fan at Fairmont Park in Copia Downs. That's how I got exposed to racing, with my grandfather. And uh, worked in the steel industry, and um, the late 70s, the steel industry was falling apart, and uh, I graduated college, and I had an hourly job at the mill and got laid off. I figured when I came back, I would get a salary position and I went down to Florida for the winter and 28 months after working on the racetrack when I got the call back to the mill, I said, forget it. And I've been doing this ever it's since. For you, it's for you. I'm fortunate. I, I, uh, when I wake up, I don't have to go to work. You know, I enjoy what I do. In, in Illinois, they had a really good state bred program. And um, the guy that I initially galloped a lot of horses for, my main, my main client or mentor, I guess you would call him, um, he had a lot of Illinois breads, and, and uh, we would run at the fairs in the summertime and get the young horses ready and then bring them to Fairmont. And uh, he and I partnered up on a couple was, was kind of how I got started. So I was the owner, jockey, trainer, band driver, the whole bit. It's kind of how I got started. And uh, then uh, eventually a guy from St. Louis gave me a string of horses to take to Chicago in 1988. And I got my assistant license at that meet and then the following spring, uh, I took out my own license, so I've been partners and, you know, gal for people and had a horse or two of my own for, for a long, long time. What are those horses you've ever had as a trainer in your name? Ten. At one time, ten. Yeah. And uh, usually I, five or six, and ten when I got ten, I was trying hard to get rid of two or three of them. You know, they we we had won a big race in Keeneland, and I got home, and uh, you know he was a very inexpensive yearling that got you know that turned out to be a good horse and so i got a bunch of other inexpensive horses that were inexpensive horses so um i like to keep it small where where me and perhaps uh no more than two other employees because when i when i train i'm i'm the trainer right i get on them and, and like to truly be hands-on not just say i am uh, i actually do a great deal of the work and i, I find that very rewarding i got it i got into horse uh, and stayed in racing because I love the horse. How are the economics of the, the um, of training a small stable changed? Um, it's always been, it's always been tough. It's always been real tough. And <clears throat> for somebody like me, um, I'm a big part of my labor force, right? And uh, so, you know, like, like any other in industry or business, your labor and your help is a big part of your costs. And those are going up and up. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, people are getting, it's harder and harder to find good help, whether you have two or three horses or whether you have 30 or 40. Lucky enough to have the same guy for a long time. Tell us about Lucio, Lucio Mata, who's been with you, you said, like over 30 years. Well, going on 30. Going on 30. It'll be 30 in January. Um, I was at Oakland and had three, and was the, I was doing everything, hot walking, galloping, Rubbing and uh, his friend or his boss was a friend of mine I had three horses and in between um, My horses I would go up and help Mike and, and gallop his horses and uh, Mike passed away and uh, One morning and all three horses that Mike trained were owned by the same man who was a mutual friend And he gave me the horses and the old man's been with me since Talk about the decision when you came to Kentucky and, and why and your thoughts reflecting back on that move. Well, I was getting better horses, you know, and I was never home. Um, when I started out at Fairmont, you could you could pretty much be there nine, ten months of the year and, you know, travel if you wanted. There was always something to do. And if you know, your downtime was a month, you, you know, there wasn't a lot going on. So you didn't have a lot of expenses. Um, but I kept getting better and better horses. I started going to Oakland and had some success there. And then I, I ran across... Uh, Came across a nice horse and uh, had some success in Kentucky. Had some success at Keeneland with him. And uh, since I was never home, it was getting hard on the home life. So we were looking for uh, another year-round circuit. So it was either move up to Chicago or, or move to Kentucky. And I, the horse near the bank gave me an opportunity to get my foot in the door here. And I guessed right because the industry has gone to hell in Illinois and it's you know, it's always going to thrive in Kentucky. At least I, I hope it's always going to thrive in Kentucky. So, and it, and it's been a, it's been a benefit. And uh, you know, I've been here 25 years now, so we're still at it. Tell us about the horse that won the Transylvania. Well, that's near the bank. That's the one. Yeah, that got near me. the banks. Isn't he, was, it? he was a $3,500 yearling purchase, and uh, he wound up winning three stakes 
Uh, he won a couple overnights in Chicago as a two-year-old, and then to Transylvania was a is a race uh, three-year-old. So he was two for two on the surface at the distance, and I and I took him. Uh, I shipped him from Oakland to to uh, Keeneland to run him on the turf. We had play, stakes placed a couple times on dirt that winter, and he was finished second to Boston Harbor in the Ellis Juvenile the year before. So he was a pretty decent kind of horse, and then. Uh, um, that kind of opened some eyes and, and uh, I moved to Kentucky the following year and brought him back and he won a money allowance race that year. So, so you were helping Lucio with, when the horse was getting a bath and you made the comment that I'm not Brad Cox and we were making the comment, uh, not many people are, so, yeah. but you represent more like the other 99% of the horsemen and horse racing. Probably, uh, yeah. But it's getting harder and harder for that 99%, it seems, to, you know, stay oh, in business. Certainly. And like I said, I have a huge edge because I do a lot of the work, you know. I mean, could I you, like it. Could you afford it if you weren't galloping your oh, own no. horses? No, not, not for what I charge, you know. And I have to get more, you know, I have to get a whole lot more than what I'm getting. I'm basically, I'm basically volunteering that. If I had to pay someone, I'd be in a hole. Um, you have one horse, which we've been, what we watched train this morning. Yeah, well. And I, it's hard, though, to keep those horses and to replace horses that you lose in this day and age. Yeah. Because the claim, well, I, is claiming the number one way that you get horses right now? Oh, uh, at the moment, yeah. I've lost nine shakes in a row. It's, I mean, I'm, I've got, I've got uh, empties I'm trying to fill, and you go over there, and I dropped nine times, and uh, I got one, and the horse was voided. The one I did get was voided at the test barn. I've gone over a couple times and passed on a couple, and a couple times I've gone over to get them, and they were scratched. You know, where we had planned on dropping on them, and they were scratched. So it's been a, you know, it's a struggle. It's uh, There are fewer and fewer horses to be claimed, and more and more people going at it because there are, uh, there's less risk involved with the voided claim rules and all that stuff. And, and uh, especially in Kentucky, now that, now that Churchill Downs has instituted a, some rules to keep horses in the state for a little bit but you know before this year or I guess it was last fall it was pretty much open season these are the best horses in the country they can win wherever they go and people from all over come here to claim and, and then uh, take them back they don't and then take them back the you know and and uh, uh, again I guess it's something to be said for free enterprise but it makes it tough on the locals and it certainly makes it tough on someone like me a lot of these stalls are filled by people that also have horses at Churchill. There, the, the right. big, the thing. But there's a lot of small oh, yeah. people that just have a few. And small and competent too. I mean, there's a lot of competent trainers here. It's just for the lack of the right, uh, the right connection or meeting the right person and and clicking. And you know, it's all about you know getting breaks, right? And work showing up and getting a break. Right? Wearing the right hat, the Kentucky yeah, you HBPA bet. hat. You are a proud member of the Kentucky HBPA. Yes, ma'am. What does the HBPA mean to you and do for you? Well, it, it's it's my voice. It's our voice, the horseman's voice. I mean, you know, um, uh, the everyday horseman. And, and in spite of what some of the bigger outfits say, that's their voice too. They have their back as well as mine. 